again. There we go. This is Dr. DeShavo. Welcome back. This tape is going to be on the second, such a great song, Control. We're talking about control because we're talking about control of the nervous system. So control by garbage there. Um, moving up into the 90s now with my music. So this is going to be the second part of nervous tissue. We already talked about the beginning of nervous tissue, some of the structure of nervous tissue, tissue. We talked about nerve cells. We talked about the supporting cells that help to nourish and feed them. We talked about white matter and gray matter. Gray matter is cell bodies that helps to control the tissue of the nervous system. White matter is going to be myelinated axons, which is gonna facilitate the movement of action potentials down a nerve. We talked about the general structure of the brain with gray matter being on the outside and then we have a layer of white matter and then deep inside we have gray matter. So we have different areas of control. Okay, so just some of those structural things. Um, you might wanna take a minute and just buzz through and review that. So now we're gonna move into neurophysiology. So we've talked about some of the microscopic structures. Now we're gonna talk about the microscopic function of nerve tissue, because this is a creature unto its own thing, okay? So neurophysiology. So a little electrics review. I'm just gonna bring you in. I'm not gonna test you about these. It just some thoughts, okay? Voltage is the measuring of the, po uh, the potential difference between two points, the electrical difference. Current is gonna be the flow of charged particles. So when we're talking about electronics, we've got electrons, which move through wires. That movement through wires helps to create the lights or any electrical activity that we see. In the body, charged particles are going to be different from these negatively charged electrons and electronics. In the body, the charged particles that we deal with are um, positively charged sodium and positively charged potassium. So we're getting into concepts that are a little difficult, so really try to Try to visualize this on the microscopic level. If you can visualize the axon, the movement of sodium and potassium across the membrane of that axon is what makes that axon or that nerve work. Listen to that again. The movement of sodium and potassium into and out of the axon is what makes that nerve work. So the whole concept that we're talking about right now is the movement of charged particles. Okay. Resistance, we're not even going to really get into this at all, is going to inhibit the current. Okay. We have insulators that will inhibit it more, conductors which facilitate it. Don't even worry about that. Get the general gist of voltage and current. Okay. So plasma mem membrane. In order to move the sodium and potassium through the plasma membrane, it has to go through channels, protein channels. There's our little purple people eater channels going through the cell membrane. So we're looking at part of the cell membrane. There's that phospholipid bilayer that we're familiar with. And then we've got that protein channel. Now, through that channel, we can pass electrons. Okay, Those are called voltage-gated. There are chemicals which can go through these protein channels. Those will be chemically gated. Mechanically gated just means pressure creates an opening for them. Okay. Here's the key to this. All of them are ion specific. So we've got protein channels that'll just let sodium through. We've got protein channels which will just let potassium through. And we've got ch protein channels that'll let both of them through. We've got protein channels that'll let other substances through as well. But for the action potential, we need to understand there are specific sodium channels, there are specific potassium channels, and then there are sodium potassium channels. Okay, so they're all ion specific. Electrochemical gradient. So we've got to understand that this is what this means. Let me bring you back out for a minute. Okay, this is what this means. In a resting cell, when we're talking about a regular old cell just hanging out, on the outside, we have a higher concentration of sodium. It's not big enough. Okay. On the inside, we have a higher concentration of potassium. 
So if we're talking about plain old diffusion, and these ions can sneak across the cell membrane, potassium is going to want to move where? Out of the cell, and it does that. It sneaks out of the cell. It moves along that concentration gradient from high to low concentration. Sodium is going to want to sneak where? Inside the cell, okay? And it does so. It'll try to sneak in through the cell. Not in major amounts. This is just little leakage, okay? So the electrochemical gradient is going to reference this um, diffusion of ions from higher concentration to lower concentration, okay? And what will happen is the sodium-potassium pumps will kick in, push the sodium out, push the potassium in. So our body is constantly, our cells in our body, I should say, are constantly regulating this balance or this concentration, okay? So electrochemical gradient. So resting membrane potential. We have more um, negative ions inside of this cell. We tend to pump those positive ions out. We also have, don't forget, in addition, we don't just have sodium and potassium in our body. We have other ions as well that are negatively charged. Primarily, we're going to talk about proteins inside the cell and chlorine outside the cell. I'm not going to really get into that much. But realize, in addition to these positively charged ions, we've got negatively charged ions or proteins inside and outside of the cell. Now, for a resting cell, we're going to have more negative ions inside of the cell. Okay? We're going to have more negative ions inside of the cell and we're going to pump more positive ions out. So that's going to create an overall negative charge in this cell. Remember with the sodium potassium pump, we're going to pump three, let me put it here, three positive sodiums out. So this is sodium potassium pump, two positive potassiums in. So if we're pumping more positive out, Overall, the cell would feel more negative because we have negative cells inside. We're getting rid of the positive cells, okay? So resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. It can vary. You can go up and down a little bit, okay? It can go up and down a little bit because we always have a flux of ions going in and out. Potassium is going to try to leak out. Sodium is going to try to link in. So we're going to kind of have, if we look at a graph, a wavering line of a resting cell, and that's going to vary from negative 40 to negative 90, okay? So if I were to take a voltmeter and actually stick it in an axon and measure the charge of that, it's not going to stay negative 70 perfectly all the time. It's going to vary, okay? So let's graph that. This being time and this being millivolts, that's how we're going to measure the voltage of these axons, of these nerves. So, we've got negative 70, but as time goes, we can have a little bit of a wavering from up to down, okay? And it can vary from negative 40 to negative 90, okay? Once again, sodium, if you're looking at your notes here for resting membrane potential, sodium's trying to leak in, potassium's trying to leak out, and those sodium-potassium pumps will try to reestablish that negative 70, okay? Resting cell, just hanging out. Graded potentials, if you look at your next slide, graded potentials. Okay. When the cell is resting, and we have this little wave up, and this little wave down, and this little wave up, and this little wave down, they actually have names. If we're talking about negative 70, if we go above negative 70, it's called depolarization. So above negative 70 is depolarization. Below negative 70 is hyperpolarization. So below negative 70 is hyperpolarization. I hope you can read that. If not, it's right on your notes, okay? Excuse me, depolarization, hyperpolarization. So that's at a baseline of negative 70, 70 being the normal. Above negative 70 would be depolarization, becoming more positive. Below negative 70 would be hyperpolarization. This just happens. This is what's happening in a resting cell. Okay? 
action potential. So here we go. An action potential, guys, is what makes a nerve work or function. It also helps muscles work or function as well. But let me go through the steps of this for you, okay? So we're not talking about resting, we're talking about a nerve that's working. So the nerve that just told my arm to work, this is what happened to it. It performed an action potential. And that action potential then sent a signal to the muscle, made that muscle contract. So this is what happens. This is tough. So if this doesn't make sense to you, watch the tape again, send me an email if you don't understand it or, or see me in person, okay? Because this is tough. Action potential. When we graph an action potential, it's going to look like this. Okay. We're going to start at negative 70. We're going to move up. There's a peak. There's a little dip, and then it comes back. Now, there are some important numbers to know. Negative 70, we're going to go with as the baseline resting membrane potential. Okay. Negative 55 is going to be what we're going to call threshold. Okay. And I'll explain this in just a second. And then the peak is going to be positive 30. So what happens is sodium, and if you think about that picture that I just drew for you, Sodium is going to be in a higher concentration outside of the cell than in. So if I open sodium channels, sodium is going to go from a high concentration to a low. It's going to move from outside the cell to inside of the cell. If a positive ion or all those positive ions move into the cell, the cell will become more positive. Again, sodium channels open in the beginning of an action potential. Sodium moves from the high concentration outside of the cell to the low concentration inside of the cell. Moving all those positive ions inside the cell makes the cell more positive. And we see this movement up, which is known as detolarization. So sodium moves into the cell, and we undergo what's called depolarization. I'm going to just shorten that because I'll go past. Depolarization. Okay. So sodium channels open. Enough sodium moves in to make the charge negative 55, which is threshold. What this means is, at that point, the sodium channels will open enough to perform an action potential. It's an all or nothing phenomenon. It's going to happen in negative 55. At that point, more sodium channels open, sodium pours in until we reach a peak of negative, or I'm sorry, positive 30. Okay? That's depolarization. At that point, sodium channels close. Done. Now, potassium channels will open. Now think for a second about that picture that I drew. Potassium is at a higher concentration inside of the cell than out. If you open the potassium channels, potassium will move out of the cell to the surrounding environment. Okay? The extracellular fluid, I should say. So if we're moving potassium out of the cell, potassium is a positively charged ion, the cell will become more negative, and we start to move down in that millivolt graph, okay? So potassium is moving out. This is called repolarization because it's moving back towards negative 70. Repolarization. Repolarization is moving back towards negative 70. It'll get to negative 70, and then there's this little dip here. Let me tell you why that dip is there. And that is called hyperpolarization because it's going below negative 70. So this is our hyperpolarization. Okay. The reason that this happens, that it goes below, is because those potassium channels are slow to close. And because they're slow to close, it keeps leaking out and it makes it more negative than negative 70. Okay. Action potential is done. So let me zip through that one more time. And if you don't get it, go back, review it, and see me. Action potential is going to make a muscle or a nerve work. We start at negative 70 as resting membrane potential. We start to have sodium channels open. Sodium flows in, it makes the cell more positive, it performs depolarization. Once it reaches negative 55, which is threshold, 
it will then peak at positive 30 and action potential has been almost completed, performed, okay? Positive 30, sodium channels closed, potassium channels open, potassium streams out of, not streams, moves out of the cell, it becomes more negative because positive ions are flowing out. Those positive potassium channels are slow to close, so we get this little dip called hyperpolarization, and this process is repolarization until it gets to negative 70. That's the electrical current, the electrical voltage that happens with an action potential. So once again, if you move your arms or you make your nerves work, and you were actually, um, you know, put two um, receptors in there, you would see the millivoltage change just in this way. Okay? That is an action potential. It's tough. It's tough. If you don't get that, let me know. I'd be happy to talk it over with you. Okay? So let me zoom you in here because I know that there are some close pictures that I'd like you to see, okay? So action potential, muscle and nerves work. We've got negative 70 millivolts. We'll peak at positive 30 with negative 55. You'll see negative 50 as threshold. I'm going to go with negative 55. If you give me negative 50, I would not mark it wrong by any means. Depolarization will happen. Repolarization back to negative 70. And then that hyperpolarization below negative 70. Okay. So this is the actual steps that we just went through. Okay. Resting stage, sodium leaks in, potassium leaks out. Depolarization is when sodium rushes into the cell, threshold is reached. Repolarization is when the sodium gates closed, potassium rushes out of the cells, and then hyperpolarization is when the potassium gates are slow to close. Okay, I think this is a good picture. It shows you the voltage. Um, it shows you when the channels open and close. So I like that. I think that works well. Okay. So sodium potassium pumps is going to redistribute those ions three sodium out, two in. Okay. Action potential. So that axon hillock, that extended area that's between the cell body and the axon is where an action potential happens, or begins, I should say. Begins there and it travels to the end of that axon. It's all or nothing. I talked to you about that. Either happens or it doesn't. Once it reaches about negative 50, negative 55, that is threshold, there will be an action potential. Now, the refractory period. When those sodium gates are open, another action potential cannot occur. Okay. When the potassium gates are open, a stronger action potential can stimulate another action potential. It's called the refractory period. So basically what I want you to understand is once an action potential has happened, unless a stronger action potential comes along, it cannot override the resetting of that nerve. So refractory period you could think of as a resting period until the axon resets itself for the next action potential. Okay. So axon di diameter and degree of myelination is going to determine how fast a nervous impulse will happen. If you look at those nodes of Ron Pierre that we talked about, there's a little picture right there. That's where the action potential happens. Then the ions are moved quickly to the next node of Ron Pierre, and then moved quickly again. We talked about that in the last lecture. So it's not that they jump, they just move quicker through the areas of myelination. That quick movement is called saltatory conduction, and it's going to move the action potential quickly and efficiently down through that axon. So saltatory conduction. All or none, we, we talked about that. When an action potential reaches negative 50 or 55, it's either going to happen or not. Self-propagating means once it starts at the axon hillock, it's going to push its way all the way down. It's not going to stop or slow down halfway. Okay? Speed of transmission is going to change once again with the diameter of an axon and the myelination of it. It varies all the way from 5 to 250 miles per hour. Okay? Amount of transmission is zero to several hundred um, feet per second, I believe that is. Okay. So, very quick in some cases. Now, MS is an autoimmune disease that affects that myelin. It, be, it hardens it and makes it non functional. So, they cannot send the appropriate signals down nerves. It can cause visual problems. That's quite often one of the first signs and symptoms is a visual disturbance. 
one of the other first signs and symptoms is weakness. And quite often, it's very mild. They'll say, oh, I picked up my coffee cup and I drop it in the morning, or I can't brush my hair anymore. Um, their coordination becomes not as efficient. They may have speech disturbances or urinary incontinence as it gets further into the disease. And it's all because of that little, those little fatty sheaths becoming hardened or sclerosed, some people call it. Okay. Um, th there's more to that, but we'll leave it at that for now. Okay. So impulse conduction slows and eventually can cease because that myelin is not facilitating that speed of that action potential anymore. Very sad. They're doing great, great things with MS now, though. They have a lot of medications that slow the progression of the disease quite a bit. Oh, here we go. And here, here they are. Some immune system modifying drugs, because this is considered what's called an autoimmune disease. So for some reason, this person's tissues are attacking that myelin <clears throat> and hardening it, okay? Interferons, copazone help to hold these symptoms at bay, reduce complications and disability. I also know that they use steroids um, as a first line treatment for this, or they have been. Some have, physicians have been. Okay. This is not the best picture in the world, I apologize. But if you look at the picture on the white, uh, right, you can see there are whiter areas um, up towards the brains in the middle of it and around the edges. It, doesn't show up as well as I, I originally had thought. So, But those sclerotic plaques actually show up as whitened areas. So the person on the right has had a progression of that MS, okay? And you can see there are whiter areas showing up, a little bit thicker, a little bit denser, whiter areas. Okay? So nerve fibers are classified according to diameter, how thick they are, the degree of myelination, the speed of conduction, okay? Um, there's, I, I think, I, oh, here they are. Oh, good. Okay. So nerve fiber classification. So all of these are according to their diameter and myelination. Group A are large diameter, but highly myelinated. They're very fast. C are the smallest diameter and unmyelinated. These tend to be um, autonomic nervous system fibers. So gastrointestinal, reproductive, um, things like that. Okay. Group B are interme intermediate diameter, lightly myelinated. Okay, also autonomic nervous system. Motor fibers um, and motor to our organs are pretty quick, so we can have a quick response, okay? I'm sorry, motor fibers to the body, not to the organs. I apologize for that. I had a little space out there for a second, okay? So how information is transferred from a nerve to its target? So if you think for a second, where do the nerves go in our body? Right, everywhere, absolutely everywhere, okay? So these nerves are going out to muscles, to organs, to other nerves, to eyes, right? They, everywhere, to the skin, okay? So the way that we transfer information is we don't just keep sending the action potential across the receptor. We have the nerve go to the muscle or whatever it is that's receiving the information there's a little space called the synapse. What travels across that synapse? So this would be the end of a nerve. At the end of that nerve, there's actually going to be a receptor. So let's use, for example, a muscle. A nerve going out to a muscle to stimulate that muscle to move. I think that's one of the easiest things to conceptualize. So the end of that nerve is gonna come right next to that muscle. There's a space called the synapse. And through that synapse travel chemicals to stimulate that muscle to move. So let's look at this picture. Okay, so we've got a picture of an axon and let's say that that axon is going to a muscle. And there's a little space in between. I think I'm going to bring you out and actually talk to you about this. Um, one other thing, we're not going to talk about electrical synapses. We're going to talk about chemical synapses and chemicals that go across, okay? So there are some that actually will transfer ions across that synaptic cleft. We're going to talk about chemical. So let's look at these. So we've got an axon. But an axon 
have some coming down. Oh, it's not bad for me. And let's say we're talking to a muscle. So I'm, you know, I'm just doing this to make it a little easier for us to understand, but realize that these axons are going to go to all different types of structures in our body. Now the space that's between the axon and the muscle, this space, I'm going to label this as one, is the synapse also known as the synaptic cleft, interchangeable, okay? So this, number two, the end of the axon, is going to be the presynaptic uh, membrane. We're just going to use membrane as a general term, okay? You could say axon, you could see the presynaptic nerve, I suppose. But presynaptic membrane is what I'm going to call the end of that axon that touches that synaptic cleft. So if that's presynaptic, three, where this muscle is, is going to be postsynaptic membrane. This is also right in your notes if this is hard to see. So the synapse or synaptic cleft is the space. Two is going to be the presynaptic membrane. Three is a postsynaptic membrane. In this case, we're going to have an axon as the presynaptic membrane and a muscle as the postsynaptic membrane. So let it blow your brain. It's the synapse. Presynaptic is before, postsynaptic is for after. Okay? So we're going to transmit chemicals from the axon to the muscle. And we're going to put it into that synaptic cleft, or that space, and it'll travel across to receptors on the muscle. Okay? So moving on to the next slide. This is a chemical synapse that we're talking about. So I'm going to explain this process to you, and then I'm going to... Um, I don't have them written down. Okay. That's okay. I'll write down the steps for you. Okay. So I'm going to give you a visual, and then I'm going to write the steps down for you. So, an action potential comes down the axon, and what happens is it will release calcium at the end of the axon. That calcium will trigger the release of neurotransmitter into that synaptic cleft. I'm going to write all these steps down for you, so just try to visualize it first. Action potential comes down. Calcium is actually in little vesicles at the end of the axon. It's released. The calcium is going to stimulate the release of neurotransmitter into that synaptic cleft. Okay. Neurotransmitter goes into that synaptic cleft. It'll attach to the muscle and it'll stimulate the muscle to perform an action potential. Okay. So action potential comes down the axon, releases calcium into the synaptic cleft, that or I'm sorry, to the end of the axon. The calcium stimulates the release of neurotransmitter into that synaptic cleft. It attaches to the muscle and it stimulates the muscle to perform an action potential. Okay, I don't think I really need to rewrite that. Um, if you need me to go over it with you, I'd be happy to. It kind of walked all the way through. Okay. So the neurotransmitter that will be released into the synaptic cleft, in this case, is going to be acetylcholine. It's one of the best known neurotransmitters. It's one of the best studied um, neurotransmitters. Okay, so we get acetylcholine. Then what will happen is after the muscle contracts and it's time for it to relax, there's enzymes which will break up that acetylcholine or the acetylcholine will break up and just disperse into the extracellular fluid or it'll go back to the axon to be reused. There are three different ways. I'm going to go over that in just a minute. Okay? So, one more time. Axon talking to muscle. Action potential comes down the axon, releases calcium, which goes to the end of the axon, which releases neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Neurotransmitter stimulates the muscle. The muscle is then triggered to perform an action potential. Okay? Not that bad. Okay, I don't have a movie here. I'm sorry, I forgot to take that off when I redid the notes. It's the basic gist. Please, if you have any questions, let me know. That is tough. It's tough stuff. Okay, here we go. I'm going to zoom you back in. Okay. So, 
moving down. Now these neurotransmitters can either be excitatory or inhibitory. What that means is it can either cause a depolarization or excites that postsynaptic cell or membrane. And if it depolarizes it, I want you to think about that, um, that graph that I drew for you. If you depolarize a cell membrane, you're going to bring it closer to threshold. So that would excite that, and it wouldn't take much more sodium to create an action potential. Inhibitory is going to hyperpolarize or move it away from threshold, and it will make it less apt to fire. Okay? This is what happens with medications. Medications can either excite that postsynaptic cell or inhibit it. And different cells will accept different medications and have different responses to it according to their receptors. Okay? So when you get into pharmacology, it's sort of the general gist of that. Postsynaptic excitation or inhibition neurotransmitters can be either dependent upon the receptors. That's key. You could take medications that will have nothing to do with one area of your body and totally latch on to other areas of the body. Okay? Neurotransmitters are short-lived, so these responses tend to be short. Okay? So after the neurotransmitters do their work, they do one of the following. They're reabsorbed. So what will happen is they'll leave that synaptic membrane and go back into the end of the axon and be reused. Dopamine's a big one that does that. They can be destroyed by enzymes, you're just broken down, or they can diffuse into our circulation and be reused. Okay. Three important neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is a big one. This is going to be the one that goes to muscles. It also goes to nerves. It goes to different areas of the body, but primarily, it's it's the primary neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter in muscles. Botulism will inhibit it. Botulism, um, we, we can actually never, ever, 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 ever eat a can that has exploded or it looks like it's popped out. That can possibly mean that it has what's called botulism toxin in it. Toxin in it. Botulism is um, an infectious agent that if ingested will actually go into your bloodstream and will paralyze the muscles that go to your diaphragm believe it or not, okay? If you paralyze the muscles that go to your diaphragm, your diaphragm is your primary muscle of respiration, you will stop breathing, okay? So botulism is bad. What they're doing, if you've heard of Botox though, is they take botulism, they eject it in their face, and it paralyzes facial muscles. Well, one of the things that they're finding now is that it travels back on the olfactory nerve and it can get back into the brain. Mm, doesn't sound good. Curare's poison darts. Um, you can actually get it, I think, from frogs. And if this is injected into somebody, it could cause paralysis. And once again, the problem with paralysis is breathing. Okay, it paralyzes the breathing muscles. Norepinephrine is a big one, also known as noradrenaline. Adrenaline may ring a bell as, as that fight or flight hormone that is um, released by what's called the sympathetic nervous system. We're going to get into a couple weeks. And noradrenaline and nor or norepinephrine is going to facilitate responses that increase heart rate, respiration, and our ability to move quickly. Okay, dopamine is a big neurotransmitter in the brain, and it really is um, important in our emotions. It helps us to feel good, but it also facilitates movement and coordination with people with Parkinson's. Well, let me rephrase that. It facilitates movement and coordination in people who don't have Parkinson's. It's um, decreased levels, causes Parkinson's disease, and Parkinson's disease will go over in the future. Um, people tend to have a very stooped posture, a shuffling gait. They have, let me bring it out, I'll show you my Parkinson's. Okay, they have what's called pill rolling. Um, their hands are constantly moving this way until they're ready to move. Then when they move, they actually will stop that pill rolling. They have a mask-like face, you see when they talk to you, they talk to you like this. They have a stooped gait, I'm not going to show you my gait. They have a stooped gait and they tend to walk flat-footed. They um, don't have that ability to lift the feet up and coordinate that heel-to-toe rolling that we do. Okay, it's a neurological disease because of a lack of dopamine, and that lack of dopamine in specific areas of the brain will help, um, will stop helping that coordination of movement. Okay, it's kind of a sad disease. 
there are tons of other neurotransmitters. I'm going to introduce you to them as we go, rather than giving you a laundry list and having you memorize it. These three I do want you to know for now. They're three biggies, okay? Cocaine increases dopamine in pleasure centers. And what happens is because it increases the dopamine, we will actually, what's called, it's called upregulation, will create more receptors for that dopamine. And because we create more receptors when we don't do the cocaine, we don't have the high levels of dopamine, those receptors are screaming for more dopamine. And that's where the addiction starts to come in, okay? So that's called tolerance. So the numbers of receptors increase, you need more dopamine, and that vicious cycle with cocaine happens until you break it and your body will down-regulate those receptors so you don't have as many as receptors and you won't crave the cocaine as much. That's why it's just so incredibly addicted, addicting. So withdrawal, increase of number of those postsynaptic receptors so you need more to feel good, okay? Dopamine production is decreased. You also, that's one thing I forgot to mention, you actually will produce less dopamine if you are using cocaine, it produces it for you. So, I just thought these were cool pictures at the end. Okay, neurotransmitters, that's what endorphins look like close. Acetylcholine, looks like monster teeth. Okay, and we talked about this termination. Guys, thanks a bunch, okay? That's a tough lecture. I'd be absolutely happy to help you with anything you need to review or you'd like to know. Please come see me. You know, I know that that's a chunk of change when we're talking about um, axons and neurotransmitters and oh, it's just a ton of information. So um, let me know. You know, if you have a question, shoot me an email. I'm going to leave you with a little song on my way out as I, as I sh um, shut off all the technological stuff. So thanks a bunch. Please let me know if you have questions. Bye.